Hi everyone, welcome to the webinar. My name is Julia Shida and I will be acting as moderator for today's webinar entitled Managing Chronic Pain for Adults Experiencing Homelessness, a production of the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council with support from the Health Resources and Services Administration Office of Special Population Health. This is a one hour presentation with the last 10 minutes reserved for Q&A. A selected number of questions will be answered at the end of the presentation during the Q&A session. Thank you for your participation. I would now like to turn the mic over to Barb Wismer. Barb? Welcome, and thank you for participating in today's webinar. Today's session will be focusing on chronic pain. Chronic pain is a common, serious health issue in the United States and appears to disproportionately affect persons experiencing homelessness. It is challenging to manage for many reasons, including the side effects and risks of medications and the difficulty accessing non-pharmacologic treatments. The Healthcare for the Homeless Clinicians Network recently convened an advisory committee to develop adapting your practice recommendations for the care of homeless adults with chronic non-malignant pain. We will be drawing on these recommendations for the presentation. Our first presenter is myself, Barbara Wismer, MD, MPH. One interesting aspect about being both a host and a presenter is that I get to introduce myself. I have worked with underserved populations for my entire career and with homeless people for 14 years, both as a clinician and as an administrator. I am a physician at Tom Waddell Health Center and Homeless Programs in San Francisco's Department of Public Health, an assistant clinical professor at UCSF School of Medicine. Prior to this, I did community-based prevention research at UC Berkeley's Center for Family and Community Health. I am board certified in both internal and preventive medicine. My areas of interest include chronic pain, traumatic brain injury and cognitive impairment, and quality improvement. Our second presenter is Rachel Solotaroff, MD. I've had the privilege to work with Rachel on these recommendations, as well as to hear about some of the amazing work that she and others are doing in Portland. She is medical director at Central City Concern and assistant professor at Oregon Health and Science University. Central City Concern is a multifaceted agency whose mission is to provide comprehensive solutions to homelessness. Rachel currently sees patients half-time at Central City Concern's Old Town Clinic, a designated health care for the homeless program, and spends the balance of her time as medical director and teacher of OHSU internal medicine residents as part of the OHSU CCC social medicine curriculum. In the past five years, Rachel has also overseen the transformation of the Old Town Clinic into a patient-centered primary care home with a special focus on integrated primary and behavioral health care. I will now start the first part of the presentation. Our purpose is to introduce the Adapting Your Practice Guidelines, which were developed by the Clinicians Network. Our learning objectives are, number one, to provide background and context for the guidelines for treating chronic pain among homeless individuals. Number two, to familiarize providers with guidelines for evaluation, care plan, and management for homeless individuals with chronic pain. And number three, to demonstrate possibilities for team-based integrated care for chronic pain in a primary care setting. You can see our roadmap on the slide. At the end, we will have time for question and answers. Why is this topic important? Well, it's in the national news. There's a rising tide of opioid overdose deaths. This is occurring against an historical backdrop of undertreatment of pain. It's also a, an HCH clinician's network priority. A national survey revealed that clinicians lacked resources for optimal pain management, lacked access to non-pharmacological pain interventions, and were uncomfortable prescribing opioids. The full results of this survey are available on the Council website. Why have recommendations for homeless people? Well, homelessness increases the risk of chronic pain, exacerbates suffering, and makes pain management more complicated. 
For example, homeless people have more frequent injuries and assaults. They tend to have less optimal and timely treatment. They're exposed to the elements. They have more frequent behavioral health problems. They have difficulty keeping appointments for myriad reasons. And they often lack a safe place to store medications. The first part of the recommendations focus on evaluation and treatment of individuals, starting with the history. The first recommendation is focus primarily on fostering a therapeutic alliance at the initial encounter, recognizing that this may be the only opportunity to engage a homeless patient in ongoing care. I'll say more about this in a minute. The second recommendation is ask about physical and mental health including history of traumatic brain injury and substance use, history of chronic pain, and living situation, including residential stability. All of these impact the diagnosis and or the treatment of chronic pain. Mental illness and substance use, including traumatic brain injury, are more common in homeless people, and these can impact treatment options. Develop a therapeutic alliance. Allow patients to tell their story and feel heard non-judgmentally. Build confidence that you have their best interest in mind. And help them understand that pain management involves comprehensive health care. Many homeless people have had negative experiences with the health care system. This is probably more so for people with chronic pain. It's important to be clear. Clarify what your setting can offer. Settings can range from a one-time urgent care visit to comprehensive continuity primary care clinic with access to specialists, and the options will vary depending on the type of setting. Specify the pace of the evaluation. Usually this takes several visits, and it's important for patients to know this ahead of time. Clarify whether or not and when opioids can be prescribed. If they are a possibility, it's usually done after the evaluation is complete, which may take several visits. Some tips. Start with general questions, such as, how long have you been in this city? And where are you from originally? This allows the patient to tell their story. Tailor the substance use history. Ask more general questions if no substance use history has been revealed and then re-ask over subsequent visits. Ask more specific questions if substance use has been revealed. Explain the relevance, such as information about your drug and alcohol use can really help me figure out what is the safest and most effective treatment for you. More tips. Attend to the patient's mood and your own emotional reactions. Respond to frustrated or hostile patients with acknowledgement and interest. For example, I hear how frustrating it's been to have this pain and try to find relief. Tell me more about how it began. Inquire about factors related to homelessness that may cause or exacerbate pain and change those as you're able. For example, you may be able to arrange for a bed for someone who's with back pain who's been sleeping on a mat in a shelter. And you may be able to arrange for elevation of someone's legs if they have leg pain from edema or swelling. Moving on to physical exam. The third recommendation is defer the physical examination to the second visit if needed, or keep the initial exam focused on the area of concern. Perform serial focused exams as tolerated if needed. Look for evidence of occult alcoholism or addiction. The history may take time, and substance use may not be revealed in the history, so look for signs. The fourth recommendation is practice trauma-informed care during the physical examination and in all patient encounters, recognizing that individuals who are homeless are likely to have experienced some form of previous trauma. There's more information on trauma-informed care on the Council website. The physical exam is an opportunity to continue to develop trust and rapport. Tips. Explain what a comprehensive visit will entail, what parts of the physical exam that you will be doing. Ask permission to perform the exam each time, 
and explain what you are doing, going to do before touching the patient. These are some of the basic tenets of trauma-informed care. Next is plan and management. Use a universal cautions approach. The rationale for this is that there are high rates of substance abuse and dependence in the homeless population, increased risk of opioid misuse, abuse, and diversion, and difficulty among providers detecting misuse, abuse, and diversion. There's evidence among homeless patients and providers that providers are not very good at determining whether or not patients are misusing, abusing, or diverting. The approach is to do an ongoing assessment, including function and aberrant behavior or behavior outside the treatment plan, and also providing additional structure, such as treatment agreements and urine drug testing. For plan and management, develop functional improvement goals with the patient. Some examples from my own patients include uh, being able to do chores in a residential treatment facility program or being able to have a hobby, which for this patient was uh, taking care of their fish. And for another patient, walking outside every day. Include self-management techniques such as pacing, relaxation, and stress management as well as physical activity or exercise, and include a behavioral health plan. Choose non-opioid medications based on the etiology of the pain, comorbid conditions, medications, and other factors, and add a trial of opiates when indicated. Finally, make a plan for safe storage of medications if prescribed. When prescribing opioids, use Using a, universal, excuse me, using a universal precautions approach, use a written treatment plan, patient provider agreement, informed consent, multidisciplinary care team to address patients' myriad needs, a consistent non-judgmental approach to behaviors outside the treatment plan, routine versus as-needed urine drug tests, and follow-up based on stability and risk. There are examples of forms for the written treatment plan, provider agreement, and informed consent in the appendix of the Adapting Your Practice recommendations, which are available on the Council website. Now I'll tell you about one of our policies in San Francisco for monitoring and managing prescribing of opiates. It is an example of a universal precautions approach and a structure for monitoring for and managing behaviors outside the treatment plan. I work for the Department of Public Health in San Francisco, which has 14 primary care clinics. One of our policies is aberrant drug-related behavior in the use of controlled substances in the treatment of chronic non-malignant pain. Its purpose is that it defines a uniform minimum standard across sites for monitoring, responding to, and documenting aberrant drug-related behavior or behaviors outside the treatment plan. These are also called red flags or yellow flags. Aberrant drug-related behavior is an umbrella term that includes behaviors that may result from abuse, diversion, misuse, or pseudo-addiction. These overlap with behaviors resulting from the chaos and vulnerability of homelessness. For example, patients can miss appointments because of transportation problems or being in jail, and their medications may be lost or stolen because of assault or theft in the shelters. The first procedure is to monitor for aberrant behavior. In the policy, there's an aberrant behavior checklist, and below or on the slide are listed examples of what's on the checklist. Refill request earlier than expected. A report of lost or stolen prescriptions or medications. Missing appointments with the provider. Presenting to clinic intoxicated or under the influence of drugs. Abusive or threatening behavior towards staff. Altering or stealing a prescription. Other procedures in the policy. Get urine drug test on initiation of a therapy then at least yearly on all patients. 
pill counts may be substituted or added. Evaluate including a differential diagnosis and respond to each episode of aberrant behavior. Document review of the treatment plan and agreement with each episode of aberrant behavior. And get a mandatory documented peer review for repeated aberrant behaviors. In general, responses to aberrant behavior might be to monitor more closely, dispense medications in smaller quantities, require substance use treatment, taper off controlled medicines, or talk with the patient, the patient or colleagues to gather more information and make a plan. This policy also improves consistency across the system and provides structure and support through the reviews for providers and teams. This concludes my presentation. I will turn the mic over to Rachel Solotaroff. Thanks so much, Barb, and thanks for having me here. I'm going to take a few minutes to tell you about, um, to zero in on model of care, um, and give you first a little bit of background from the literature on models of care for caring for chronic pain patients, particularly those who have um, histories of addiction. Um, so from the, our basic place that we started was to utilize a multidisciplinary team and then to really adapt a chronic disease care management model, similar to the models that we use for um, depression, for diabetes, for our congestive heart failure patients. And this helps us to organize our thinking um, as well as in a way to destigmatize chronic pain. <clears throat> Some aspects of the chronic disease care management model that we've used are to stratify patients by their complexity and by risk, stratifying them into different levels. Patients um, then, as they progress, are able to graduate to each new level. And as such, we have goals and outcomes for every level. And we utilize care managers as well as a registry to track our patients and outcomes, again, similar to what we do with depression and diabetes patients. So first, a little bit of background from the literature, um, looking at has, what has worked um, in approaches to chronic pain for individuals also with a history of addiction. Um, and as you may have noticed in your own literature reviews, there are not a lot of, there are not many trials or programs documented for this. What we've been able to found look specifically at many of the things Barb already mentioned, including integrated and structured care, close monitoring, multidisciplinary teams, as well as adjunct therapies, such as cognitive behavioral therapy, physical training and physical therapy, um, other analgesics, meditation, and acupuncture. And this picture here is of our group acupuncture room in our clinic in downtown Portland. A couple of reports of programs elsewhere, and I can get you these full citations if you're interested in reading the studies more thoroughly. Um, these are programs that were um, where people were being, people in particularly high-risk groups were being prescribed opioids. Um, one used a experimental group with very close monitoring of urine drug screens and compliance checklists um, and utilized individual and group motivational interviewing compared that and compared that to standard treatment. In that study, they found a reduction in misuse, but were not able to demonstrate an improvement in functional or quality of life outcomes. Um, another trial looked at integrated care with a psychiatrist, pharmacist, and a primary care provider. Um, in that one, the results were somewhat different. A third of them still had serious misuse, but they were able to show a reduction in mean pain and depression scores. So we had some variety of outcomes that we can achieve from these different care models. There was an article um, about a VA program which utilized a multidisciplinary team with close oversight by a nurse practitioner and a pharmacist, and they received additional support from a multitude of um, subspecialists, including a psychiatrist, a rheumatologist, an addiction psychiatrist, a neurologist, and an orthopedist. This also emphasized early recognition and very effective co-management of co-occurring disorders, um, including addiction, um, depression, bipolar disorder, and they showed about 45% adherence in that program. 
<clears throat> so I'm going to sort of pull back here for a minute and tell you a little bit about a theoretical framework that we started with when we were thinking about what we wanted to do with our chronic pain patients. And this was developed by a um, psychiatrist here at Central City Concern. And it's not exactly a, these aren't research categories of individuals, but again, just a theoretical framework of how to think about what you're trying to achieve. So this psychiatrist put his um, patients who were duly diagnosed chronically homeless individuals into three kind of categories, spin, float, and integrate. And if you think about the spinners, those are individuals who are on a run. And these could be people with um, severe mental illness, with addiction, um, with chronic pain, any, any combination thereof. And when somebody's spinning, they're in and out of the hospital, they're out of their medications, they're not taking their medications, um, sometimes, often on the street, um, engaging in criminal behavior, in and out of prison. And then often in healthcare, our goal is to get these folks just to this position of float. And when we get people floating, um, that's where they are. They're back on their medications. Um, they've maybe been able to achieve some disability benefits. They have housing, maybe a SRO nearby. But there's no, um, their time is spent primarily hanging out, watching TV, smoking cigarettes, eating pizza, often hanging out in your lobby. And often we as a medical community are happy there because at least these individuals aren't doing damage to themselves or others. But where the psychiatrist has really pushed us to go is to move individuals beyond just that stabilization float phase to one of real meaningful integration and recovery where those individuals have supportive peer relationships. They have um, even intimate relationships. They have purposeful and meaningful activities that they're engaging in um, and are able to really bring their lives to a place that embodies um, hope. And so we decided that we realized at a clinic that we had really been arrested and feeling good about getting people to float and we wanted instead to raise the bar for ourselves and for others and to try to get them to this higher stage of integration and recovery. So we sort of thought about our mission and goals and wanted to, again, instill in people recovery and lifestyle changes that could give people access to new techniques to manage their pain, um, to give them education and this access to enable them to make new choices about how they live their lives and manage their pain, as well as a mindful approach. And we also wanted to be very realistic about addressing the issues of chronic pain and addiction. Um, I have a colleague um, in recovery here at Central City Concern, and she said, you know, there's, there's no safe place um, for individuals in recovery to really talk about their pain. She said, it's very difficult if you're in an NA or an AA meeting to say, you know, I'm on pain medications to help with my avascular necrosis of my hip, which makes it unable for me to sit comfortably. And we had found that if we ignore either the pain or the addiction, then the other one, that, the one that was being ignored was going to interfere with our ability to deal with the former. So I'm going to tell you we, about some different programs that we built somewhat in um, parallel tracks, and then I'll try to tie it all together for you at the end in terms of how we put together uh, a more comprehensive pain management program. So our program for our highest risk individuals, those who have um, a high opiate risk score or who have a history of addiction is a program called Hot Sauce, which was developed by one of our alcohol and drug counselors here. And as I said, Hot Sauce is a group counseling program for high risk patients with chronic pain. And currently, the program is for folks who are taking who are being prescribed opiates for their pain. It's led by one of our A&D counselors. It's a 12-week program. And then in addition to the weekly group visits, there are weekly or bi-weekly one-on-one sessions with Steve, the A&D counselor. And the goal, as Steve describes it, is to support these patients to take prescribed medications appropriately and to improve their quality of life. Um, he works on giving them a new outlook regarding their pain um, and to basically decrease its centrality in their lives. And also, as I mentioned earlier, to create a safe space in a community where people with this chronic problem 
can learn from one another and discuss their experiences, dealing with their pain, engendering hope, and overcoming obstacles. Um, we do have limits on who can engage in hot sauce. If anybody is in, active in their addiction or in early recovery, somewhere less than three months, they're not a candidate for this program, not a candidate for opiates, if indicated. Um, following Hot Sauce is a program that Steve has entitled Hot Sauce Light. It's more of an aftercare program that meets every other week. Um, there's much more emphasis on physical and mindful modalities for managing their pain using Qigong, stretching, um, <clears throat> and meditation. As I said, there's less emphasis on recovery work and more on mindfulness and physical activity. When Steve designed Hot Sauce, he, um, he's in a recovery himself and thought about what somebody who is in recovery but also trying to manage um, taking opiates would require. And he really created a fusion of a more traditional alcohol and drug treatment group and a more traditional chronic pain group and brought those two together. So he spends time talking about what is addiction um, as well as how do you prevent relapse. Um, he spends lots of time on self-care techniques, um, handling stress, as well as a high primacy on building a support network. He feels very strongly that old, um, when you work in addiction, when you do addiction work, um, assist, one of the primary things is you have to build new relationships and new environments um, in which to live, um, and ones that support recovery, because going back to old people and habits and places often triggers relapse. So he uses that support network also to foster a cycle of change. Um, he spends a lot of time talking about de-escalating cravings, understanding that opiates, and we try to avoid short-term opiates in people who, ha or short-acting opiates in people who have a history of addiction, but there still can be cravings, obviously associated with long-acting opiates, and methods to de-escalate those. Um, I'm going to jump around here a little bit. and move to talking about um, improving a standard of life and raising the bar. Again, this concept of moving people from a float stage to one of integration and giving them the hope and the tools to do that. He does spend time talking about the physiology of pain um, and spiritual outlook options. And then finally, he does a fair bit of work just talking about the technicalities of being a chronic pain patient itself. What is the controlled substances agreement? what constitutes a violation of that, just so everybody is very clear. And then I think a lot, in his view, a lot of patients struggle with how to talk with their physicians about their pain, um, as well as being candid about some of the triggers or cravings that they may have. And he coaches them on how to have conversations that are honest um, and therefore can help to foster somebody's recovery more than trying to avoid an honest discussion out of fear of having one's opiate dosages decreased. Um, so briefly, hot sauce again is for those folks who may actually have less than a year of continuous clean time. Um, <clears throat> they may have actually have had many years of active addiction but have not used recently. They may have multiple treatment episodes, so these are high risk folks but who have verifiable pain which is responsive to opiates. And again, those who have a relationship with the clinic and have an interest in staying in the community. Another thing that we were trying to work on when we developed this program was um, not to just discharge everybody who had a, um, a single violation of their controlled substances agreement. So if somebody had been doing well for a long time and had one episode of cocaine in their urine, um, if, we, if we just had said to them, look, that's irresponsible, that's dangerous for yourself and for us, and we're discharging you from those opiates, 99% of the time they were leaving the clinic going to another clinic and the problem was never being addressed and was starting all over again. So to obviously not put ourselves or those patients or the community at risk, but to try to face that addiction head on and engage the person in a recovery um, community with um, close monitoring. And we felt that mitigated some of the um, collateral damage of having those individuals traveling around from clinic to clinic throughout the city. In order to graduate from hot sauce, individuals need to have 100% adherence to the program and to the controlled substances agreement. Anybody who, everybody needs to have at least one behavioral health assessment 
and they need to have ongoing engagement if indicated. And everybody self-identifies goals and individuals need to have shown some progress toward those goals in order to graduate. So moving on, this is a different program that we started and it's a, it's, this is for individuals who are not as at higher risk as the hot sauce folks, but who have pretty low self-efficacy and low self-management regarding their chronic pain. And for these folks, we set up group visits run by our occupational, uh, run by an occupational therapist. These group visits happen monthly um, with the occupational therapist and then also streamline the monthly visits that these individuals have with their chronic or with their primary care provider. The visits last about an hour and a half once a month. Again, they occur in a group and then individuals leave that group for 10 to 15 minutes for a very focused um, structured appointment regarding pain with their primary care provider. Also, we have, we work with um, a school of occupational therapy and those students do bi-weekly phone outreach if possible, um, to patients in these groups to follow up on how they're doing with their goals. So this occupational therapy um, curriculum was developed by our first OT. It's under revision a bit as we recently hired somebody new who has a very strong emphasis on mind-body medicine as well as neuro and biofeedback. But for now, the, the topics in the group include, you can read them here, back health, body mechanics, communication skills, nutrition, relaxation, sleep. And for all of these, they will do the OT and the students will actually do some um, activity related to that. So for relaxation, they will do a guided relaxation. For nutrition, they actually do some cooking. Um, they talk about sleep hygiene. Um, there's a session on home safety <clears throat> and fall prevention and our OTs actually um, do go out and do home visits with individuals which um, to get a sense of their um, home safety and function. They spend time on energy conservation and pacing, stress management. There's a session on cognitive behavioral therapy where we actually have one of our behaviorists come in and run that group. A session on um, a type of meditation called open focus. There's an, a kind of visioning session um, where the patients create vision boards as well as learn some basic Tai Chi moves and leisure exploration. And I won't spend too much time talking about why we chose occupational therapy. Some of it was um, serendipity um, and some of it was um, really that this seemed to be a discipline which was able to encompass a vast swath of self-management techniques for people with chronic pain. The OTs obviously can do a lot to improve function. Um, they also have a strong behavioral health focus and a strong mind-body focus. Um, we also found that given we were, that we were trying to move to the stage of integration, which has a strong emphasis on meaningful occupation, that the OTs were suited particularly well for that. We certainly use other providers, such as behavioral health um, providers and physical therapists as needed, as needed but um, the core of this part of the program is run by our OTs. So in order to graduate from these groups, um, individual patients must have a reduction in their centrality of pain score and that's the quality of life score that we've chosen to use. It was developed by a woman named Christina Nicolaitis here at OHSU and while there are lots of um, pain scales and I'm sure many of you have ones that you like. This is the one that we've used a lot because it really got at, for us, function and quality of life by focusing on how central a role is, playing pain, is pain playing in your life. And we've found that as that score goes down, people's own activity um, and their level of integration is going up and actually their opiate dosages are going down as well. In order to graduate, these folks also need to be engaged with behavioral health. Um, need to have at least one initial assessment and then ongoing engagement if indicated. There needs to be a progress towards self-identified goals. And in order to graduate from these groups, from these groups, um, patients do need to show a reduction in their opiate dosage. Again, the idea being that we have given them more skills and tools to manage their pain in order to minimize what the pure pharmacologic intervention has been. 
Finally, the last element of the program I want to tell, would like to tell you about is our Controlled Substances Review Committee. Um, again, these are based off of things from the guidelines that Barb referenced as well. And this is a committee, a committee that does essentially what it says, reviews um, uh, problematic or questionable cases um, of patients on controlled substances. It's a multidisciplinary group composed of an alcohol and drug counselor, um, one physician um, who has some background in addiction medicine or is board certified in addiction medicine, a psychiatric nurse practitioner, a behavioral health therapist, and our occupational therapist. And what the CSRC does is basically reviews cases that are, that are referred by the providers. Anytime there's a violation of a controlled substances agreement, um, <clears throat> um, that case needs to be referred to the CSRC. If a provider just has a question about management, that case can be referred as well. Um, and we recently instituted a policy that if a provider wants to start a new patient on chronic opiates, even if it's a new patient who's being transferred to us, who's been on opiates in the past, um, all of those cases must be reviewed and approved by the CSRC first. And then the CSRC makes recommendations and referrals. So last couple slides, just trying to tie it all together for you. So this is our chronic pain recovery pyramid, again, which looks to try to use a disease management model to stratify these folks and give us a little bit of clarity in our thinking about them. So at the bottom of the triangle are our level one um, patients. And I have to say, in all reality, right now, our triangle is probably more pear-shaped than anything. Uh, I think our higher level of risk folks in level two probably make up the bulk of our patients. But we're working towards the day where the bottom of the pyramid are those people with um, <clears throat> less risk and with high self-management skills. And people in level one have a relatively low centrality of pain score, less than 30. Again, have good self-management skills, are very low risk, can be seen by their primary care provider only every two to three months for um, regular checkups and medication refills. In level two are the folks in our occupational therapy groups. And forgive the word says LAOC there, that was the former term long-acting opiate clinic that we use for our occupational therapy groups. And again, those are the individuals who are not at high risk um, but have lower self-management skills and need a higher level of intervention. They tend to have um, centrality of pain scores that are higher, they meet monthly, they have regular behavioral health if, if needed, and an optional feature of that is um, utilizing some of our other modalities that we offer here at the clinic, such as Qigong, acupuncture, yoga, or meditation. Risk management for these folks involves a urine drug screen every three months, a random pill count every three months, and a review of any adverse drug reactions every three months. And then finally, our highest level of intervention folks there are at the top of the pyramid, the level three, and those are the individuals that are in hot sauce. And they have weekly meetings. They also have required acupuncture, which is part of our alcohol and drug treatment program here. So hopefully that gives you a sense that as people graduate from one level, they're able to move from level three to level two, and then once they meet the goals and objectives of level two, ultimately move to level one. I won't go through this in too much detail, but in order to figure out where um, our patients need to go, we develop this roadmap. And a, initially, a chronic pain patient is identified either by the provider who's trying to enroll them in the program or it's a new patient. <clears throat> and that person goes first to our occupational therapist who has developed an hour-long assessment which looks at many aspects of the person's pain in terms, including their um, opiate risk, their um, um, their self-efficacy, other pain management that they, uh, modalities that they've tried, um, and finally what their level of function is. And the OT essentially makes the determination if that person can go into level one, um, if they need to go to level two for the OT groups, or if they are high risk, they are referred directly to the Controlled Substances Review Committee, who then decides if they are even a candidate for opiates, if they need to go to hot sauce, if they need to go to outpatient or inpatient treatment, or if they can proceed to level two in the OT groups. 
And down at the bottom there is just our pathway um, for our behavioral health intervention as well. Um, we did, after a couple of years of slowly assembling this program, we did get some informal provider feedback. Um, and again, this is not um, publishable by any means, but what we heard from providers is that they felt um, heartened by this approach, that they were no longer going at it alone, and they did note that their patients seemed to be taking more responsibility for their pain management. For high-risk patients, um, providers have found that um, the patients do very well while they're enrolled in hot sauce and then in hot sauce light, um, but actually once they graduate from that program, some of their riskier behaviors do recur, and that's an area that we're trying to work on. Um, providers said this feels like the right thing to do, patients seem brighter, and that the patients seem to appreciate this sense of community as well as continuity among their pain management. So as we move into this next phase of our program, we're trying to focus much more on um, our outcomes. And this is, we're sort of at the ground level here, and I hope to be able to give you more robust outcomes in the next couple of years. But we've divided them into five categories. Um, one is around safety, so monitoring the frequency of urine drug screens as, recommend, as recommended, recording any violations of controlled substances agreements, recording <clears throat> um, how many pill counts were done um, per recommendations, as well as looking at the frequency of actual reduced opiate dose. In the category of quality of life, we'll look at um, tracking our centrality of pain score over time and may add some additional quality measures. We're also looking at self-identified patient goals and having quantitative but also qualitative progress towards those. We'd like to track our provider outcomes in two ways. One is practice or provider satisfaction with their own practice, um, which is sometimes inversely related to the number of chronic pain patients have, as well as the provider's own sense of their competence in managing chronic pain, particularly among high-risk individuals. And finally, chronic pain has a big impact on the sustainability of the clinic and clinic operations itself. Itself, And we'd like to look at what, um, how this program has affected some operational issues, such as phone calls related to pain meds, reducing PCP visits in their regular clinics for chronic pain, as well as increasing the diversity of provider panels, meaning that we're able to more effectively streamline our chronic pain management and therefore chronic pain patients don't crowd out under other individuals during the PCP schedule and we can increase the panels with um, a greater diversity of um, patient population. So that's what I have to say today. Thank you so much. And I will now hand the mic back to Julie. Thank you, presenters. I will now begin the Q&A session. I would like to also invite the participants to continue to submit your questions to the presenters in the chat box below the presentation box. The first question, and I will pass this to Barb, is can you explain more about how drug diversion is defined and what should a provider do if diversion is suspected? Barb? Hello everyone, this is Barb. Drug diversion is when medications that are prescribed, opiates that are prescribed to treat pain are used for other purposes. And diversion can take a variety of um, forms. People can sell the medication for pure profit motive. Uh, people can trade the medication for other medications or for drugs. Uh, people can uh, use the medication to uh, give to somebody else who they think is in need of the medication. Um, uh, so those are some of the uh, ways that uh, opioid medications can be um, used for purposes other than being taken by the patient and being um, to treat their chronic pain. Um, some of the ways um, that you might suspect that someone is uh, diverting medications are um, things that are considered aberrant behavior. And I reviewed some of those earlier, things like uh, running out of medications earlier, uh, not having um, 
uh, good control of pain and asking for higher doses of medications. Um, and for better or worse, those things can indicate other things as well. For example, if someone's chronic pain is undertreated, they may take more medications and prescribed and run out early, or uh, they may ask for higher doses of medication. That specific condition is called pseudo-addiction. Um, and um, so I think that uh, the, the approach to this is to actually uh, is several things. Number one, it's important to talk with the patient and try to tease apart what's actually happening. Um, number two, you can look uh, at a urine drug screen to see if the medication that's being prescribed is in the urine, to see if other things are in the urine, for example, illegal, illegal drugs or unprescribed medications, um, and to um, then be clear with the patient about how uh, medications are to be taken and um, um, how follow-up is going to happen. And if problems persist, or for example, if something becomes clearer, if the medication is not that's being prescribed is not in the urine, um, then that is a more clear indication that diversion is happening and the medication should not be prescribed. I'm going to turn it over to Rachel for further comments. Thanks, Barb, and thanks for the question. Um, this is a very difficult one to get at, and Barb's suggestions are great. Another way to detect diversion, um, as, I, uh, as I had mentioned, is doing random pill counts although we've actually found in Portland that um, individuals can actually rent medications from others if they know that they're behind on their pill counts. Um, you can actually rent medications on the street to bring in for the pill count. Um, so I'm not trying to catastrophize it, but it is a difficult thing um, to detect, but you're using the things that Barb suggested as well as an um, abnormal pill count. Um, <clears throat> one can pick this up. I think as far as addressing it, working directly with the patient um, is crucial. And the first thing that we did when we were trying to um, upgrade our chronic pain program, and I think our single most effective intervention of all, I'm sorry to say, was our Controlled Substances Review Committee. So to have a group of people who meet regularly to review these cases and provide um, a consistent and unbiased recommendation um, is extremely helpful and it makes it, it, it makes it much easier for the provider because they say, in a sense, I have to make this um, referral to this committee and then I really am, it is incumbent upon me to act um, on what they recommend. Um, so I would recommend that if, if you have the means to pull some of those folks together as a, probably one of the single most effective risk management interventions that you can make. Thank you. We also have another question. It looks like this will be um, the last question, and it is for Rachel. At a given time, what is the average number of participants in the hot sauce program, and is there a limit of the number of participants allowed in the program at one time? Thanks for the question. Um, the group can't get too big. You know, if it gets above um, 8 to 12 people, then the integrity of the group is hard to maintain, and I think it's like any alcohol and drug um, treatment group. Um, what we've done to try to accommodate that is, um, again, to create an aftercare group so we can keep, that's the hot sauce light group, so we can keep more people engaged at any given time. I will say we struggled with having an open group versus a closed group. Um, I think that the program works much better when it's closed and you open um, on January 1, let's say, and you close on uh, March the 12 weeks um, at the end of March. However, that does crowd out those individuals who need that intervention and may not be able to wait for three months. So currently we're working on an open system where people can join the group at different stages. And so that body of 8 to 12 people may not always be the same group um, over the course of 12 weeks. If we had a little more time, a little more funding, we would expand it and be able to offer multiple hot sauce programs at once, but um, we're not in that situation right now. Back to you, Julie. Great. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, looks like we don't have any more questions. 
So um, I'll go ahead and I'll review a couple of resources uh, that are available to you on the Council's website. Um, you can access the full report of Adapting Your Practice Recommendations for the Care of Homeless Adults with Chronic Non-Malignant Pain and also um, other clinical practice uh, adaptations. Thank you for joining the Managing Chronic Pain for Adults Experiencing Homelessness webinar produced by the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council. This meeting is now closed.